Thank you. And let's, okay. There we go. Has, can everybody see the slides? Looks good, yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this workshop on collateral and central bank policy. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to meet Stefan and to speak further with you, Michael, about my favorite topic. Uh, the title is uh, The Collateral Supply Effect on, my, on Central Bank Policy. And today I'm going, oops, okay, let me get on the right. Okay, there, now, now, now my click is working. Okay, to, today I'm, I'm gonna kind of take a broad overarching view and start thinking about like the financial stability issues we've found in the 21st century. Spend a bit of time on discussing what destabilized the financial system at the end of the 20th century, specifically focusing on the structural changes that would have taken place in collateral markets. And then on my main point, the implications of so-called modern finance for monetary policy. Uh, then I'll close discussing a bunch of the solutions that people have proposed to the March 2020 crisis as well as my own. So let me just dive in and start talking about financial stability and what happened in the 21st century. We of course have the 2007 to 2008 crisis and I think, you know, one, you know, to, to frame it simply, obviously it was very complex. We can think about the fact that Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, uh, many other institutions were using mortgage-backed securities and other private assets as collateral for funding their activities. And what we saw both in March, 2008 and September, 2008 was a, a, a repo run and I'll be talking in more detail about what do I mean by a repo run. Um, but the short form is there was a repo run in 2008 where the funding for this private sector collateral dries up. And what had to happen was that the Federal Reserve jumped in to provide funding. Um, and you'll see, I have a very you know, American perspective because it's the American situation that I really know. Um, so, so I'm afraid I, I, I'm not making all the connections to Europe, but th th they're there. Um, that's just not my area of expertise. But so the Federal Reserve stepped in to provide funding through the term securities lending facility, the primary dealer credit facility, and in addition, something that's kind of less observed regulatory relief so that the banks could actually finance the same assets for their dealer subsidiaries. And the, one of the big regulatory responses to the crisis was to say, wow, we purchase agreements markets shouldn't be relying so much on risky private sector collateral, but should be relying much more on safe sovereigns. So we did have actually a fairly strong shift in the repurchase agreement markets after the 2008 crisis. So that it's really mostly relying on sovereign debt right now. And that's why the March 2020 coronavirus crisis kind of makes you say, oh, wow, well, what's going on? There was a movement to safe sovereigns, and yet we found there was another repo run where the funding for long-term treasuries dried up and the Federal Reserve had to stabilize the market by buying 5% of all marketable treasuries over the course of 18 days. I mean, the size of the Federal Reserve purchases are, are really astounding. Um, so, so you kind of sit here and say, hmm, what's going on with this system and why do we need, suddenly need a, a level of central bank intervention that we've never really seen before in uh, the sovereign debt markets, uh, not in terms of quantity, but in terms of quantity and speed. Certainly, you know, central banks during wars have been supporting government debt, you know, for centuries. Um, but they didn't really have to dive in and do it over a course of two weeks. So there's something else going on here that we need to think about and um, study. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time going back and saying, well, what was going on at the end of the 20th century that led us to have really a, a very different and less stable system in the 21st century? And stage one, I would say, is that there's actually been a transformation of our markets for collateral. 
And this is where we can start trying to understand what do we mean by a repo run? What is a repo run? In the past, most of the collateral was based on what I would call a mortgage type contract. And I'm using that in a very broad term, uh, as a broad term, not just referring to housing lending. And those are contracts that tend to favor the borrower. They're the kind of collateral contracts that have protections in law and have had protections in law you know, for, uh, for more than a century. The collateral is often a liquid. Just like your typical mortgage, there are no collateral calls. A decline in the collateral value is actually the lender's problem, not the borrower's problem. And then there are legal restrictions on the ability to foreclose and sell. Yes, you can foreclose and sell, but it's kind of slowed down. There's a whole bunch of legal process you need to go through. Uh, bankruptcy can really interfere with your ability to foreclose and sell. It's just, we've got legal process on these traditional collateral type contracts. In the late 20th century, there's a growth of repo-based collateral contracts. And I'm, I'm, I'm calling it repo-based, um, Margin contracts is another word for it. These are a particular kind of contract that, yes, has been around since the 19th century, uh, but was very small in the past. It was a very small portion of our financial markets. And these contracts favor the lender. The collateral is liquid, it trades on markets. Uh, the borrower faces a collateral call if the collateral value declines. That's one of the reasons it's very safe for the lender because the lender gets to keep on increasing the collateral when its value declines, but it puts the borrower at a great deal of risk. The lender has the contractual right to foreclose and sell quickly. And in fact, over the last few decades of the 20th century, there have been increasing legal rights for lenders to foreclose and sell quickly. There have been exemptions to bankruptcy law and to other aspects of the law that used to slow down this process. So where do repo runs come from? They come from these specific characteristics of repo-based collateral or margin type collateral. And that's where we see this repo run coming from. And one of the reasons it's so much more important these days is because we're relying a lot more on this kind of contract than we used to do in the past. Okay, so that's stage one of what destabilized the financial system at the end of the 20th century. There are other aspects, and this is that, you know, around 2000, there was actually a really big change in how the repo market was fun fu functioning. And this is because um, in 1997, JP Morgan actually, uh, was a major repo dealer, which meant that it was a price setter, uh, setting terms in the repo market. And in 1987, with the Asian financial crisis, it actually brought its operations, its repo dealing operations onto the books of the commercial bank subsidiary, which meant that it was FDIC insured and is suddenly tied into you know, our, our, our banking system that has access to the central bank, right? Whereas when it was on the dealer subsidiary there, subsidiary, there were strict restrictions on the degree to which it could get financing from the central bank, at least in theory. Of course, we roll those back in crisis, but that's a different issue. Um, and then in the 1990s, Chase Manhattan was one of the core tri-party repo clearers. What does that mean? It means that Chase Manhattan was enabling money market funds being vast amounts of retail and institutional money to lend on the repo market. In 2000, the two banks merged. And so what you have is a single mega bank that's uniting the functions of funneling investor money into the repo market and also determining what assets can be repoed and at what price. And I actually argue in my paper that essentially what happens is JP Morgan Chase becomes a de facto central bank monetizing assets on the terms it sets in the repo markets. Essentially, whatever terms it set became a, a benchmark as a reliable source of funds against that asset. And so people were trading these assets as if they, they were sure to be able to get cash on them. Uh, as per J.P. Morgan Chase's terms. And actually, if you look at both Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers uh, failures, it was when uh, J.P. Morgan Chase uh, 
looked at their collateral, said it wasn't enough and issued collateral calls that took both of them down. Um, okay, so that, that's one aspect. That's the second stage of what destabilized the financial system at the end of the 20th century is that we kind of had this growth of repo markets and you know this, this essentially uh, a monetization process that was caused uh, by the private sector. And there's another aspect that really supercharged things, and that's that we created a modern financial system very much at the request of the financial lobby. We deregulated derivatives trading by lifting common law restrictions on gambling via derivatives. Um, I, I know the US law, and this was the Commodities Futures Modernization Act. Um, then in the UK, there's a similar Financial Services Act that does something similar. We increased the regulatory emphasis on collateralization of exposures, both after the long-term capital management crisis, but also Basel tends to do this as well. Um, and then also there's the integration of deliver derivatives collateral with repo markets via master agreements. So when I talk about repo collateral, I'm actually talking about derivatives collateral too, because since uh, 2005, and that's a, a US law, I'm uh, confident that I don't know the details, but I know that in Europe as well, there, these, uh, there is the same integration of derivatives collateral with repo markets. Um, and, and so we're talking like about a vast market for collateral where the collateral moves from supporting derivatives exposures to the repo market and back and forth. And, and, and it's all an integrated market through these master agreements and the legal structure supporting them. And you know, just as a note, um, this is one of the things that allowed uh, uh, the CDOs of mortgage-backed securities to uh, function and be created as a way of supporting the securitization industry when it was slowing down. They were able to use derivatives to uh, essentially multiply the amount of subprime collateral so they could sell more securitizations. But um, this is all part of this big picture of, of, of the changes in the law that made this possible. Okay, so my summary would be there have been structural shifts in the system. And this is the system at the, by which we define uh, how collateral works in the financial system. And these structural systems are, structural shifts are in fact designed to exploit central bank liquidity provision. And that's a point that uh, Katerina Pastor makes in the Code of Capital. In the past, it was the central bank that determined what assets were monetized, but today, repo and derivatives collateral is monetized. This happens via universal bank dealers. And yes, regulation does make a huge difference in what can be monetized. And that's one of the reasons we're talking most about sovereign debt now. Um, but essentially we think th this collateral is monetized in some sense by a market with a huge central bank backstop. And, and, and this is one of the main forces that's causing destabilization. So if we want to come back to our, 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 our bigger picture, the structural shifts, the relationship between the structural shifts in the 2007 to 2008 crisis is that we had a liquid, liquid assets like mortgages that were made liquid by mortgage-backed securities. We had um, derivatives that could be used to overcome cross-border regulatory barriers to investment. And we see housing markets boom in advanced economies. There's this coordinated boom in housing markets. Um, derivatives uh, also were used as synthetic assets that overcame this problem of a lack of supply of assets. They encouraged subprime mortgages to be made so that you could have your securitizations. And then they multiplied the amount of those sub subprime mortgages um, through credit default swaps. This is all part of the same system. And that's where we get the subprime crisis. So then we shift to sovereign debt. And now we're having long-term treasuries and gilt treated as liquid assets as if they didn't have interest rate risk, even though everybody kind of knows they have interest rate risks. And we have this situation where central banks are forced to act to prevent interest rate risk from being realized. And you know, the classic picture of this is the Fed purchases of treasuries. This is from March 1st to April 15th, 2020. And essentially underneath that mountain, 
sits 5% of marketable treasuries. Um, and you know the Fed basically had to do this to um, stabilize the markets and keep the price of, uh, of treasuries from, from soar, sorry, the yield of treasuries from soaring and the price from plummeting, uh, causing the collateral that all of these people are posting collateral in their contracts, um, causing that to fall. So in order to keep people from having too little collateral and being foreclosed, the Fed had to support the markets. Whoops, wait, sorry. And okay. So when we think about what are the effects of modern finance on monetary policy, there's this merger of fiscal with monetary policy. Um, on the one hand, what I've been talking about, the structural instability due to these fire sales that are intrinsic to the repo contract, the fact that the lender can foreclose and sell, and you have this massive selling on the market that forces the central banks to intervene. But also important, when a government uh, issues new debt, because of this collateral system, that new debt demands funding on the money market and therefore it has effects on money markets that the central bank ends up having to accommodate and take into account when it's implementing its interest rate policy. So that's one way in which fiscal and monetary policy are very closely related in this, brand, this new world. Um, but also monetary policy is now supercharged by a collateral supply effect. And that is when you raise interest rates, assuming that your short-term interest rates do map in to a change in long-term interest rates, the yield on your long-term bonds rises. And for example, if you have a half of a percent increase in the yield on your long treasury, you can easily find that your long treasury falls by say seven or 8% in value. Everyone who holds that treasury now has 8% less collateral because there was an increase in interest rates. This can easily explain, you know, why do we see taper tantrums? It's because people can't afford to have their collateral uh, fall in value like this. And, 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 and so it's creating these interesting dynamics that mean that central banks have difficulty adjusting policy. So this is an important aspect, the collateral supply effect on monetary policy that, that needs to be considered. Okay. I think you know one of the things is, is this like wartime support of government debt? The answer is really no, because monetary policy is constrained in normal times. And that's those are those points that I was just talking about, like the taper tantrums and the fact that new debt issues uh, affect funding on the money market. But also, you know, the COVID-19 crisis may be like war, but March 2020 really wasn't. The issue was structural flaws in the financial system. The problem was not that governments were issuing too much debt. That's not what was causing um, the, the yields to rise. It was the structural flaws in the financial system that were causing the sales and the, of, of the debt. So, so this is something to keep in mind. When we look at proposed solutions to the March 2020 um, events, people have proposed having a central counterparty for treasuries. They've proposed changes in dealer regulatory requirements, a standing repo facility, and a dealer of last resort. Those are kind of the key proposals that have been brought up. The first three all basically offer an incremental improvement in liquidity. And it's really hard to understand how they could be large enough to solve the problem that needed to be solved. 5% of all treasuries need to be purchased in 18 days. And if you're only making kind of incremental improvements, the likelihood um, that that would be adequate to meet the need that we saw in March, 2020 just seems, seems hard to believe. So, so that, that would, that's my question for people who are proposing those as um, a solution. And in addition, no, dealer of last resort worked. I think you know, the Fed stepped in and it was able to make the purchases, but we need to think about the size of the action that needed to be, take, be taken. 
And the fact that we really have taken measures that we usually uh, are basically beyond, particularly in speed, those that would typically use to finance a world war. Also, the Fed had to step into you know, corporate uh, credit markets and support those. So, so we really have taken a much broader effort than um, was used in the past. This is a huge change. And I would actually argue that it would be better to reduce the liquidity of long-term treasuries. Having regulation that discourages the repo of longer-term treasuries and um, you know, it can, treasuries are, can still be used as collateral in traditional contracts subject to standard protections for borrows, but these repo contracts with their terms that allow for very quick foreclosure, for collateral calls, for you know, fast coordinated sales, that it's, they're not appropriate for long-term bonds. That's my bottom line. So my conclusion would be that we've seen structural shifts in the financial system that have been destabilizing. They interfere with the implementation of monetary policy through both the collateral supply effect and the effect of long-term debt issues on money markets. And the effects could be eliminated by discouraging the repo of long-term bonds. The cost would be that long-term bonds will be semi-liquid again. They'll still trade on long-term markets as, you know, on bond markets as they have in the past, but they won't have this, uh, monetization effect where you can, you know, use them as repo collateral and, um, and, and get kind of instant money on them on a funding basis uh, that is uh, very easy. Lenders like repo, they're very happy to rent on repo because they're so protected. Uh, your borrowing will reflect the fact that long-term bonds have uh, interest rate risks, so the liquidity would be lower. Um, but again, it's not necessarily a big deal to have semi-liquid long-term bonds because in fact, you know, up through the 1980s, that seemed to work far, fine for our financial systems. So I would argue that that is really a policy we should be thinking about. Okay, that's the end. So I'm gonna stop my sharing here and hopefully we can move to a discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Caroline. Um, super interesting. I mean, I've I've spoken to you about this and, and looked at the paper in detail and um, would like someone more experienced than me to kind of join in, in the, on the discussion. That's why we invited uh, Stefan uh, to join. Stefan, would you like to um, sort of share your first thoughts on, on the paper? Sure. The presentation? Um, I'm, well, first of all, I'm very honored uh, to be invited and it's a privilege to discuss uh, Caroline's paper. I had seen it for the first time, I think, in summer, just when it came out, but it was a good occasion to now really read it again a bit more uh, closely. Um, I also listened to the podcast that you made about the um, uh, paper, which I also can recommend. Um, in the podcast, um, you were telling a bit about your methodology, right? So uh, Michael already mentioned it, that you have not only the economics, but also law background. And you explained in the, in the podcast how you research in, I mean, how, how you really get, get the nitty gritty and cutting edge stuff of the plumbing just through uh, Twitter and um, blog users. And I think that's a very good methodology. I, so I just want to, this is basically my, my first thought that I basically like the, the general approach, approach that you have. And um, I think it's very, commendable the paper in general how you um, tie various things together historically and the cutting edge system and also look for your own um, framework to um, deal with these things um, so what Michael asked me is to give a bit more the, the kind of um, high level comments maybe um, and also say why it matters for society um, given the the nature of this conference and I think it's quite obvious why it, why it matters because the repo market has become the heart of the financial system, maybe the monetary system, depending on how we define money. And um, it's still probably not really well reflected in most textbooks. Um, uh, I think it's still more of a small group of people who really deal with it. And you make a very strong point. And the point is that we can't manage it, right? So we have some kind of established uh, monetary policy tools and they don't work. So you th that's how I uh, understand your collateral effect, right? We can go only in one direction, but not in both uh, directions more. And so we're kind of stuck on a one-way street. Yeah, and I think this is a very serious thing and we have to uh, um, 
deal with that. So in that sense, I'm a big fan of your paper. I wanted to raise five points for discussion and I try to be quick to go over them. So the first point would be if there's any merit to a repo-based system. The second is that I'm interested in your concept of off-balance sheet liabilities. The third um, that you talk about monetary and fiscal policy as concepts. So I'm kind of, I wanted to address that and then talk about policy implications and relevance to Europe since we're like a like German or European um, conference. So um, first of all, the centrality of the repo market. And I wanna be a bit the devil's advocate here because of the way I understand you is that you say, if we could, we should just get rid of it, right? So I mean, there's the, there's the big transition from a bank-based system to the kind of market-based system. So I take that as a given. And the question is, is there any merit to a market-based system? Did the repo market fix any problems? And at least there are these arguments in the liter literature that I'm familiar with that would say, yeah, there were problems. So the system before wasn't perfect. And so this is, I mean, uh, yes, it destabilized, but it also had some positive effects. If it's that big institutional investors needed uh, ways to safely store uh, their uh, money. Um, so th this is a bit my question. Do you, do you see any, any merit to that? Um, or what do you think about those um, statements? Also, you say, I mean, I, I realized that now in the, in the, in the presentation that, uh, so you basically start relatively late, I thought historically, where you say instability arose, but I don't know, hasn't the financial system always been instable? I mean, aren't we all a bit Minskians now and think that stability is destabilizing? So, um, and then there are ways to attribute specific, um, well, I don't know, flaws to how the repo market was organized, right? So the point, in the 2007 to nine crisis was that you didn't use treasuries, but maybe these kind of securitized private debt uh, um, instruments as collateral, right? So maybe that was the error. And then what I haven't read in uh, your paper, but which is, I think Pajar stresses it is then the role of Basel III also for repo market instability. So you could also say, well, it's the regulation uh, that basically created those problems. So not necessarily my, um, personal opinion, but I think it would be interesting to, to hear, well, is there any merit in this? Is this an endogenous solution maybe to some problems? Um, then the second point, you talk about off-balance sheet liabilities and contingent instruments at the beginning of the paper, which I find very interesting and I'm very on board with that it's relevant to find ways to cope with um, things that you do not report on balance sheet or maybe that, that do not necessarily exist right away. So you go back to Keynes treaties on money and uh, uh, overdraft facilities. And uh, here, here I have a bit of a question, how does this connect to your general argument? So did you think that repos are such off balance sheet liabilities or contingent instruments? I just didn't really understand the, couldn't really follow your uh, thought there. Um, and just one comment to that is that, I mean, in my own writings, I try to grapple with it. And I would say that maybe these contingent instruments and off balance sheet liabilities are not necessarily the same thing. Because I think you can have existing today, but you do not put on balance because doesn't, it's not necessary to be done according to accounting standards. But then contingent things I would define as guarantees, insurances that have to be like delivered upon um, in the moment of a crisis, but, but they, they would then exist maybe on balance sheet in the future. So I, and I found you, you, you subsume quite a bunch of different things under um, this off balance sheet liability. So maybe you could just comment on that. Um, then my third point is on monetary and fiscal policy. And here I want to present some sort of a hypothesis. And that is, is maybe monetary and fiscal policy just the wrong, are those the wrong concepts to still think about how we can deal with the contemporary monetary and financial system. So, I mean, my, my understanding of what, what, where, where these terms come from is that you had the Bank of England in the late 19th century and they figured out some best practices to ma manage the credit system. Um, they realized that if they change the bank rate and provide different conditions to receive emergency liquidity, then you can really influence the short-term money market and that this has longer term spillovers and that then got kind of codified and you had all sorts of theories. And then fiscal policy is at least today how we see it connected to the Keynesian revolution. And um, then both as a 
two key tools became somehow standardized in the like post-World War II ISLM Keynesianism, where you learn, okay, so the state has monetary and fiscal policy. Um, but then, then I mean, there, there are so many publications on how they overlap and you can't really disentangle them. And so maybe they're really just more ideal types. And I, I, I've actually come to think about them more as, well, management techniques that you wanted to have in order to manage the credit money system. And maybe at some point that also worked more or less. So it was created, but all of this is specific to a very, to, to a particular institutional, institutional setting. And that is a deposit-based banking system. And so if we, got, if we no longer have a deposit-based system, maybe we just have to throw those categories overboard and find just new ways of thinking how we can manage it right and do no longer need to be uh, because i mean i i found it striking that you said repo turns fiscal policy into monetary policy right and you explained it very well and so my my thought is isn't that basically the consequence of what you write so that's a hypothesis and my fourth point policy implications um so you, you said that you that your preferred option would be to scale back market-based finance and maybe go back to the old deposit-based system. And so that's more of a general thought. So the question is, what is the normative benchmark for an alternative system? And I feel often it's, um, well, historical setups that we then kind of glorify, right? And probably, I don't know, in the, in the 50s, people were very fed up with a monetary system and then they thought we need to change this and that. And then, they did it or it happened and then it became part of the problem and now we basically lose that knowledge and then we do something they found bad and turn that again into the normative uh, benchmark and i'm just not sure what could do we have any kind of feasible normative benchmark to to get a better monetary system that's the first thing so where do we get the norm from and second who can implement it um, so is there anybody who really has the power to implement it because i mean i would have my mild doubts, right? Even the Fed, I mean, as you say, they, they can only correct it like in one direction. And so I feel it's just such a decentralized system um, that I, so here comes the political economist. So I don't necessarily see the agency to, to do that. Um, but maybe, maybe you, 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 you have a different opinion. So, um, well, that was my fourth point. And the final point is just also to connect it to the topic of the, or to the conference and to Bürger um, Bewegung Finanzwende. So to which extent does your analysis matter for Europe, right? So first of all, um, to which extent are those repos so central in Europe? Um, um, I understand that the, that the way the repo markets are organized in Europe are very different because in the US you have the security dealers which are still a bit the consequence of the Glass-Steagall Act, but Europe never had that. And in that sense, repos are done more by banks. And so you have different systems, logic, um, uh, but yet then Europe is very much influenced by the American system. Um, yeah, so maybe some thoughts about that. And I stop here and thank you very much. Looking forward to your answers. Thank you so much, Stefan. That was uh, a lot of a lot of great uh, takes and also questions raised there. Um, Caroline, before you uh, answer, I was just um, trying to structure this a little bit to make sure that we don't um, go all over the place. So maybe let's leave the, the policy implications towards the end and we kind of revisit that uh, a bit at the end and you can maybe start by clarifying the, the concept of the, the off balance sheet um, uh, contingencies that Stefan was mentioning. And then uh, we, can, we can look into what Stefan touched upon with, with um, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and, uh, and later kind of talk about policy implications, Europe, and the merit to the, to the repo system, if that makes sense to you. <laughs> That's fine. I was taking notes. I'm like, oh my, I have to keep track of all of this. Okay, so um, so okay, great. I will start with you know discussing the question of the off balance sheet liabilities, and um, the distinction between off balance sheet liabilities and contingent liabilities, and also you know how how does it really connect in with my general argument? And I think all right. So I think the thing with the first reason why I bring up off balance sheet liabilities is because there's a tendency for people when they think about banking systems and bank supplied money to think about, you know, deposits as the principal liabilities of banks and, you know, to kind of look on balance sheet, you know, deposits are this thing, a monetary liability that we can all see on the balance sheet. 
and we have um, you can look at some of the uh, analyses people are making, and there's a tendency not to focus as much on the guarantees that banks have been providing as also having a monetary effect. And it's interesting because if you look at at least what U.S. regulators were saying in the 1970s, um, th they just saw instantly that contingent liabilities are just as monetary as, as, as deposits. Um, and so if a bank is going to, um, for example, provide liquidity, a liquidity guarantee to commercial paper, that was viewed as that guarantee having the effect of a deposit, right? And so it's a contingent, it's, it's an off balance sheet guarantee that's only gonna get pulled if the commercial paper issuer in fact cannot pay, right? But um, the, in fact, because it's going to be, it's a contractual commitment that the bank is going to have to honor at that moment when um, the, uh, the commercial paper issuer can't pay, it has the same effect for bank regulators, at least as the US was thinking about in the 1970s, as a deposit. It's, it's going to be money that the bank has to put out. Um, so, so these off balance sheet liabilities are, are a way of creating money too. Um, in terms of, is there a difference between them um, and uh, versus contingent liabilities? As an accounting matter, um, if you issue a guarantee and um, I, I believe it needs to be more probable than not that you are going to have that guarantee pulled in order for it to have to go on balance sheet. So basically any contingent guarantee that has less than a 50% possibility of being pulled is I believe um, under accounting norms and off balance sheet liability. So that's why I tend to kind of uh, conflate them. I do think that in accounting there is a, 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 fair, a, a fairly close relationship. Um, how this relates to my general argument is this argument that JP Morgan Chase was a, a de facto central bank. Um, I actually would argue that in the repo market by standing ready and making it clear that if you bring a mortgage backed security to JP Morgan in 2006, um, you were going to be able to borrow against that security um, in the repo market. You were going to be able to repo that security. And at the time, uh, I think according to Gordon and Metric, you could actually borrow 100% of the value, if I remember correctly what Gordon and Metric said, which is kind of like an eye opener, um, of, of your mortgage backed security. Um, and, um, and that was just the standing policy back then. Well, I would argue that by having a, a commercial bank um, supported by the FDIC and as big as JP Morgan setting those kinds of terms, that was a form of monetization. So that's, I, I, I draw, I, I, even though it's not actually an off balance sheet liability, it's just a, a, a private bank offering a standing facility, I actually think there's an analogy there. I think it has the same effect. And, and, and that's essentially the argument I'm making, that it's possible under certain circumstances, such as what was going on in 2006 and 2007 in the US with JP Morgan Chase, to have a private bank that's oper operating what is effectively a standing facility that provides liquidity. Um, so that's the argument I make there. Um, should I move on to the question about monetary and fiscal policy, Michael? Let's... Yeah, please do. And then afterwards, um, maybe we'll, we'll kind of take it back to the um, policy implications because I've already had two questions in the chat on that and I see one raised hand. So we can we should definitely keep maybe another 10, 12 minutes uh, for that. Okay. So uh, regarding, you know, monetary and fiscal policy and are these, are these even the right concepts anymore, um, which I, I think that is, you know, in the world that we're living in now, we see all of these ways that monetary and fiscal policy are interacting, and it, it, it they don't really make sense as, as separate entities in, in our current financial system, uh, which is really one of the points of my, uh, 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 of my paper, that we're living in a world where these are getting merged, and we see that um, in, in a lot of different ways. Now, the question is, uh, should we just move past it? 
<laughs> you know, is it is 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 this you know a, a relic of the past that uh, we 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 don't uh, it, it doesn't it's not an important separation and um, so I would actually argue that you know, fiscal policy, instead of being something that we think of as more arising out of the Keynesian revolution and um, as, uh, uh, as essentially coming from there, I think of fiscal policy as really about, um, it, it grows out of the efficient financing of war. So I think of fiscal policy as coming from 18th century England, right? And, and one of the reasons England was able to uh, win the wars in Europe at the end of the 18th century was because of this fiscal base that it had that came in a lot of ways from its ability to issue long-term debt. England was relying on perpetuities mostly in the late 18th century, which is you know, kind of remarkable, but actually it's, easily to, it's much easier to fully fund a per perpetuity than shorter term debt, uh, because all you need to do is pay, make sure that you have taxes to pay the interest rate payment. But um, so fiscal policy, I would argue, and the British ability to um, issue debt that was essentially not directly supported by the central bank. Though, of course, when you get to the Napoleonic Wars, you do get this amazing uh, interaction between monetary and fiscal policy that helps Britain win the, you know, win the Napoleonic Wars. But then they roll back after the Napoleonic Wars to a separation again, where you have a, a, a monetary policy that's focused more on supporting the economy and not on supporting the government when you're talking about the mid 19th century and a separate fiscal policy operated by the government. Now, it's, it's just, it gives the government a lot of flexibility when the government can do this. And, um, you know, it, it allows the government to raise money while standing separate from the central bank. And I think that's something that you can see was going on in part in the um, late 18th century in Britain. It wasn't, they didn't, weren't relying on the monetary factors of the central bank um, in order to um, issue government debt. A lot of the debt issue could take place without support of the central bank. And, and I think it's a mistake to say, oh, we can just give up on that entirely and say we don't need governments that can issue debt independent of the central bank and it's okay if everything, um, all government debt issues require the support of the central bank all the time, whether or not we're in war. Um, I, I guess I, to me that sounds like a dangerous experiment. I guess that's what I would say. It would be very new. It's not something we have a history has worked in the, a, a history as something that has worked in the past. It seems to work better if in peacetime you can separate these out. And then when you have this vast need, and yes, I agree, coronavirus is an example. It's great when you can combine these forces in something like coronavirus to make things work. But if you don't separate them out again afterwards so that they operate separately, are, are we sure we're going to be able to have that flexibility in the next crisis? That would be my question. Perfect. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, Stefan, do you want to comment on uh, any of that, what, uh, what Caroline just said? And then I'll grab uh, the questions from the chat and from, from the audience. I call for a couple of minutes because of uh, bad internet connection here. So I uh, waive it. Um, maybe if somebody else wants to. Yeah, so I didn't hear all of it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I saw that you dropped out for a second. I thought maybe you just turned off your video, but then I wasn't. I wasn't sure. Um, okay. Well, that's. Um, I had. There's two questions in the audience that were answered in the chat, and both of them kind of go into the direction of policy implications. Um, one of them was basic. Was raised by Beata. If, um, that's at least how we pronounce it in Germany, <laughs> and uh, she asks, okay, what would happen if um, if central banks would enforce negative interest rates a little more strongly. Would that in any way diminish the bond purchases and the effects that the repo market has? And um, different question, but similar angle, um, would introducing a financial transaction tax uh, exclude excluding um, some securities? Would that in some way kind of limit the collateral 
that's used in repo transactions. Um, maybe you can get back to those and then we grab Inyaki who has a question from the audience. We can, yeah, we can do that now, Mick, maybe actually. Inyaki, are you, you still wanna raise your question or point or comment? Yes, so thanks a lot. Great to see Carolyn and Stefan as well. <laughs> great, great paper, great presentation and, and very nice. Uh, um, questions by by Stefan. So I want to go back actually to the to the off balance sheet uh, commitment stuff. If I understand correctly, uh, the paper basically the argument you develop is okay. There is a collateral supply effect which kind of tar turbocharges monetary policy, especially on a tightening cycle, and this sort of makes makes um, uh, money collapse. And one of the points you make is where money money as not as measured traditionally uh, and money as defined in a in a, in a in a broader sense, and for, for that we need to better understand of balance sheet commitments. Uh, but some of balance sheet commitments are, are okay to measure. I mean, the extreme is one or one extreme we have credit lines. No, you go to the call reports and they actually tell you how much they have in committed credit lines. To the extent they are drawn, they are going to the balance sheet. And one one concept that I that I love from your paper is the uh, market making as an off balance sheet commitment. But then the question to me is, um, I mean, if you want to act upon these things. You need to measure them. So how would you go about measuring this, which is a, a major challenge, because otherwise it becomes a sort of esoteric thing that you can rationalize exposed. But but Exante, you are sort of left there, like grabbing stuff in the dark, basically. Um, OK, um, should I go ahead, Michael? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's a really good question of how do you measure um, uh, essentially market making as an off balance sheet com commitment or even like when when does a standing facility uh, mean that there's a monetization of an asset and I, I think you know because on the one uh, there's at this one extreme where if a central bank is operating a standing facility I think there's would all agree a central bank operating this is a process of monetization um, but then um, so that when we're talking about the private sector, you know, what are the conditions that would make it a uh, monetization um, situation? And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a really good question. I do think um, we would want to, you know. I mean, yeah, I guess so. So part of it is it's it's not simply a matter of measurement in some ways because you sit here and you start saying, well, you need to think about structure, right? So one of the reasons I think J.P. Morgan Chase mattered, and I emphasize the fact that it moved its repo dealing to the FDIC insured bank, is part of it is it's drawing on this bigger picture of what is the structure of the financial system, and. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a really good question. I'd like to be able to say that if you, I mean, I, I think it's possible that one could start separating out different market making commitments and different market making scenarios, and then try and draw a line and say, oh, well, we find like really large volume when you're talking about uh, a universal bank that is actually doing th something within the commercial bank subsidiary. And it's possible that if you look at that data, you'd actually be able to say, well, we're going to say that once it reaches a certain volume, it crosses that. Um, but I have to admit, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure at what the best way is to do that. <laughs> so I, 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 I'm, I, I'm not sure I have a, a, a really good answer to that. Um, I would hope somebody else can propose that. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I don't have a complete answer to that. Um, I should probably also uh, make sure I don't forget uh, Beata's questions, which were about the effects of uh, negative interest rate and the financial transaction tax on these. And in terms of like a negative interest rate, um, how do negative interest rates affect this, um, this system? I think that so far, 
Um, the system seems, even in the presence of negative interest rates, to have kept the same relationships it has had in the past. And um, I have to, I haven't thought through this idea that actually is very relevant in Germany, where even your 10-year and a longer term bonds are actually going negative. Um, and there suddenly, um, yeah, maybe maybe you do get a different dynamic. And I think I would have to look at the specific situation of what's going on with bonds um, and, and actually start looking at the data and, 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 and some details on that to be able to answer that question. Because I tend to focus on the US situation where we actually don't have a problem with negative interest rates in our long-term bonds. And, um, and so they tend to follow the standard patterns. So I have to admit, I think I would have to look at that more closely. I don't have a good answer to that. And when it comes to the financial transaction tax question, um, you know, I, I think a lot of this depends on how it is structured. Certainly, if repos are included in the financial transaction tax, that that, that could certainly have an effect on the market that um, would uh, change the dynamics of what's going on and possibly make it less important. Um, I would probably argue, well, if you're gonna do a financial transaction tax that includes repos, maybe it would be a good idea to have a slightly higher tax for longer term bonds that you're going to repo. Like we could use that, that to me, that's, that's like a tool you can make a lot of use for a use of in order to implement some of the policies that I think would be better. So yeah, I think a financial transaction tax could do quite a bit to change what's going on here. So um, yeah. Thank you very much, Stefan. Is there anything you wanna add on uh, to the comments that have just been made? Yeah, I, I just wanna maybe add to the, to the well, contingent liability. So I think, I mean, in Yaki's comment is spot on and yet we will not get away with it you can't measure it right and it's it's i think it's unavoidably an a matter of speculation so you you speculate that you're too big to fail and you're going to be bailed out which is basically a contingent liability but you don't know right and then i don't know the the ones who can do it they want to pretend that they wouldn't do it maybe because they fear moral hazard but then in the end they do it right and you have an overdraft facility of like ten thousand dollars on your bank but then i don't know if there's corona maybe they give you ten thousand so it's it, it just you just never know in advance and that's just part of the problem and I, i'm not sure you can get past that measurement error but yeah yet i think it's very very important to understand our contemporary system yeah i mean yeah in that in that podcast that you made that we've mentioned a couple times now already um i think you make the point with um to, to sort of explain a little better is it sort of an overdraft fee or like if you if you if i as a citizen have my bank account and i go there and i'm i run out of money i can still um, sort of take out an extra thousand uh, dollars or whatever my limit is, and sort of have this this contingent contingent liability there. And I, I mean that picture just kind of really helped me understand um, the probability of of what can happen. So obviously it's very very hard to to measure this kind of a, an event. And we have another question that was uh, raised in the uh, in the chat that um, sort of tries to relate the the overall growth in um, in debt and especially non financial debt in relation to GDP. I assume that's relates to corporate debt then. I don't know, I'm not completely sure what it means, but in general, like what would you say like debt, debt is rising like private and, and uh, public and how does that interfere with the uh, repo markets or how does that relate? Okay, so I think that actually for our current repo markets, um, you know, the, the private sector debt actually is, is a limited asset on that. I mean, there, there's probably a tiny fraction that actually is, is repoed, but um, if I understand correctly, I think, you know, sovereigns are so much more important to the repo market right now. And again, that is part of the stabilization um, mechanisms that were put in place after the um, financial crisis in 2008. Um, so I, I have to admit, I think that the growth in corporate debt is not really um, something that, 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 that's driven by uh, the repo market, um, at least as far as I know, maybe, you know, someone correct me. I don't, I don't think that's so much a, a repo market phenomenon so much as, um, this whole policy of, of, of low interest rates for a long time, and I have to admit, I think 
you know, when I think of what happened is the crisis, one of the ways the crisis was addressed, and this was only really in 2009 as there was this concern about the wall of corporate debt maturing, that's when the Federal Reserve um, put in place its policy and they said, you know what, we're gonna keep interest rates low for a really long time, as long as is necessary. It was uh, in, in, in 2009 that they actually committed to that. And in a lot of ways that commitment that was first made in 2009 and really helped all these corporations refinance their way out of maturing debt liabilities um, has uh, turned into an even longer commitment than I think anybody thought it was gonna be in 2009 um, because we're still at these incredibly low interest rates. And so I think when we think about the vast issue of corporate debt, it, it, it really has to do with the fact that we're completely stuck at low interest rates. Um, and in that sense, um, the collateral supply effect is part of that, you know? So, but, but that's a very indirect relationship, right? Where the collateral is actually the Southern debt. When the central bank raises interest rates, if it gets passed on to the longer term rates, it's going to shrink the supply of sovereign debt collateral that can be posted. And therefore it creates this ultra tightening effect that forces the central bank to keep interest rates low. And then this has a, a knock on effect on the fact that corporate debt markets are in this world where interest rates are at zero and going to stay there for a long time, which helps facilitate corporate debt issues and people kind of looking to, for riskier assets. So in an indirect way, um, I, I think it is caused by the problems in the repo market, but it's definitely many steps through um, that causes it to happen. Thank you so much, Caroline. I see we have a couple more questions, but unfortunately we're already approaching the end of the session. Uh, Stefan, are there any last comments that you would like to make before I kind of uh, zoom out on what we've talked about? Please, over to you. Okay. Well then, uh, yeah, I can thank you all for, for coming in. in. In real life, we would have had a, a quite a full room. We've been over 90 uh, people here uh, at times. And um, we're going to do two things here. We have about half hour break scheduled until we um, revisit the, the main plenary session in this conference with Pierre Monat and Vitor Constancio to dig deep into uh, monetary policy and inequality. But then we also have the opportunity, sort of as in real life, to try and have a mingle session as you usually would have in a, in a conference. So I'm going to post this link into the chat again here, the tiny URL on mingle. You could uh, join there. It's sort of an open room where you can walk around with a little avatar. And once you meet another person, it will open into a video chat and you can say hello. You don't have to do that, but it's just sort of an option that we wanted to uh, provide. It's, um, it's kind of neat to try out. But yeah, on, on that note, um, thank you both very, very much. It's been super insightful for me. I mean, it's this entire world of repo and market-based financial systems just keeps unraveling and it sort of has to be unpacked uh, step by step. But I think we did a good good start here and I uh, hope um, with Finanzwende especially, we can sort of take up this conversation even more in the future um, and in this, in this upcoming year. So thank you both Carolyn and Stefan and uh, have a good one. Thanks for putting it together and good luck with the conference. Thank you very much for having us. Okay. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.